Hello everybody and welcome to June's Blackstar webinar. Um, I'm Joel Richardson and I'm with the founders of Blackstar, technical director Bruce Keir, managing director Ian Robinson Hello. and the sales and marketing director Paul Hayhoe. Hello. Um, so today we're going to be chatting with the guys um, about all things Blackstar, how the company started and where the company is now. Uh, we've got some questions that you guys have sent in as well and if you have any questions that you'd like to ask while they're here, please do. You'll notice there's one man missing. He looks very similar to these guys. I can tell. But uh, <laughs> he has a hair appointment this evening, so uh, <laughs> unfortunately he can't join us. That's Richard Frost. Um, so guys, should we start by um, telling people how everybody met? Uh, yeah, do you want me to start? Yeah, Paul. Um, it all began, let me tell you a story. Um, as some of you may know already, we all used to work at a well-known amp company, Marshall Amplification. Um, and it came to a point where all of us were involved in working on new product development there, uh, which was obviously an amazing time for us. And we worked really closely together, got on really well. And around 2004, uh, we all left and found ourselves at a loose end. And um, as so many, Companies do. We started uh, with a meeting in a pub and um, we got together and um, discussed our various options and particularly what we were interested in. Did we want to work together? Could we offer something new to the market? Um, all of which the answer was yes. And following one meeting in a pub became very many meetings in pubs. Um, and that's where the, the germ of Blackstar started. Um, should probably also say that we were also in a, a band together really well-known band not really um, <laughs> including mr richardson here as well um so we kind of knew each other on a musical front as well in terms of kind of playing together um as well as working together so it was a really good fit for all of us how many pints do you think were consumed during those meetings at the pub um responsibly obviously as we were all driving <laughs> not as many as um on later evenings <laughs> so um what about instruments played and uh, musical influences? That's one for all you guys. Ooh. Ian? Do you want me to start? Yeah. I play guitar. Yeah, I've played guitar f um, since I was probably, I had my first uh, acoustic guitar when I was about nine, and mm. first electric when I was about 12. My brother played guitar, he's 10 years older than me, so he taught me how to play. And uh, I was always very influenced by, obviously, by rock music. So I was um, fortunate to be brought up in a household which was full of music. My dad's a uh, musician as well. And uh, grew up listening very early days. Black Sabbath, Free, Bad Co, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I was really into an American band called Riot from, I think, from Detroit. Where all the best bands come from, mm -hmm. obviously. Yeah, <laughs> bands like the Dogs, for instance. Yeah, I don't think you've ever had one of my influences from the seventies and eighties. Yeah, um, and then yeah, just really got into sort of the whole metal thing. I was actually very much into Queen mm -hmm. when I was um, like uh, I don't know, ten to twelve, something like that. And then got into much more into the metal thing because my brother was well into metal so got into mm -hmm. band called Accept. Wolf Hoffman was my favourite guitarist for many years yeah. uh, and then after that uh, got into the di really didn't get into the thrash thing got into the grunge thing loved Alice in Chains favourite band for a while then uh, Bob Mould after that obviously the whole sugar thing which uh, is you know we're, we're all probably a little bit influenced by Bob mm -hmm. in some way and then um yeah, after that, I got into the whole Britpop thing as well. Oasis, favourite band, favourite band of ours, Manson. Um, absolute legends. Um, funnily enough, all our favourite British brands, bands all split up, which uh, every time we got into they do two albums and then they'd be no more, which is like... Much like our own band. Yeah, <laughs> apart from we didn't do two albums. <laughs> but yeah, there you go. Anyway, but um, yeah, lots of guitars, really. That's uh, what I did for a long time. Bruce. What, what about you, Bruce? Right, yeah, yeah. right, well, first, before I go on to what I did, um, I just want to correct something. Or Ian was being a little bit modest there because he mentioned he got into Queen. <laughs> he um, is a Queen. But what he didn't mention was all the Freddie moves that <laughs> nose off 
backwards, <laughs> forwards. Yeah, that's probably not the best expression to use, actually, <laughs> considering the man we're talking about. Uh, how did I get into music? I got into music or guitars because I had an older brother who he's four years older than me, and he got a guitar, and he was very into it. And um, I was always interested in electronics as a kid, a bit of a nerd, I suppose. So I was far more interested when he got this electric guitar in the um, amplifier and the electronics involved. And the thing that changed that was being, I can remember this, I was pretty young at the time, being allowed to stay up very late to watch a film of The Who playing what was one of their famous gigs at the Charlton Athletic Football Ground. Mm. Um, I didn't even know that guitars had six strings or four strings, but I just saw this bloke who was the ox, Mr. Entwistle, <laughs> playing this funny-looking guitar, as it looked, which was his bass guitar, and just being kind of blown away without knowing why. Uh, the sound he got, um, just the way he made it look so easy and just this thunderous noise that kind of filled in the bottom end of the who. Um, so I asked my brother what type of guitar was he playing, and he said it was a bass, and from that point on, that's what I wanted to do, and wanted to play, and saved up a lot of, over a lot of weeks to buy my first bass, which cost me £24. Ooh, wow. That was a long time ago. What other bands were you into then, after, after the who? After the who? Uh, Rory Gallagher band for a long time, so I was... Uh, very into um, Rory's bass player, Jerry McAvoy. Um, he made me want to play with a pick, but I could, I liked the sound, I liked the percussiveness of it, but I could never kind of get the, uh, the technique to play it. Um, and then kind of as you grow older, you just become more influenced by more, a wider sphere of people, I think. Sometimes you can hear um, something on a TV show or something like that, and it's got some session guy um, playing absolutely amazing bass lines that you kind of only hear once in a while and yet he's uh, totally anonymous so it's um, just anybody who has a distinctive sound a distinctive way of playing I think is worthy of attention Okay, cool So we've got guitar and bass what about you Paul? Uh, I'd say once I started working with people like the people I'm sat next to I stopped calling myself a musician because I realised despite thinking I was able to play I wasn't very good really oh, in the greater yeah. scheme of things modesty. so uh, <laughs> I'd like to say it was false modesty but unfortunately it's true <laughs> but I played um, started out on guitar uh, when I was about 16 um, got very into the whole recording thing so needed to be able to put bass lines down so I started playing bass um, played bass in the last couple of bands I was in and then as part of the recording and production thing then got into keyboards and sampling and other stuff as well so I'm more of a jack of all trades master of none is uh, my take on things in terms of music um, very much a misspent youth uh, very into the early punk scene very big influence on me um, Sex Pistols Buzzcocks then as I matured the more depressing kind of side of things like Joy Division and people like that Sisters of Mercy all that kind of good stuff um, anything I did that I had was on the fringes or had an alternative slightly more controversial message uh, bands like Crass, people like that, which most people probably haven't heard of, but um, used to get me all hot under the collar and angry when I was young. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't really changed that much. <laughs> okay, cool. So um, many people would say that starting an amp company in an already established market was a pretty brave thing to do or a mad thing to do, one or the other. What made you so confident that it would succeed? Ian? I've got a nice little story for that one. Tell us a story. Can I tell you a nice little <laughs> story? On this one <clears throat> I, it's one um, I was recounting the other day about um, sometimes when when you're in a band or a kind of group situation mm. uh, you have a you have a certain vibe and I remember um, an interview that I read with Bon Jovi you heard this one the other day but <laughs> I'm sounding like somebody else I know used to tell all the same old stories but <laughs> any anyway um, read this thing with Bon Jovi and he said how when he was met up with with Richie and the rest of the band um, he just knew it would work and he said that's why he gave up work they probably all moved into house together they just they just worked tirelessly to be in the band because he knew he would definitely make it with that mm. group of players and 
all the band situations I was in with respect even to the band we were in. We kind of probably never felt it was going to definitely make it, but mm. the chemistry between the, the four of us and later the six of us when you and Keith joined, it was... Um, it was really special yeah. and we felt that we definitely had the right chemistry between us that it had to work mm -hmm. and it's an unusual thing that you kind of once in a lifetime you meet a certain group of people in a certain situation and you know because of the way we all work together that we had a really really good chance so mm -hmm. it was um although it was brave it was we we are somehow had this almost naive feeling that it couldn't fail yeah uh, right. and then once you once you commit to do it, it can't fail. So mm -hmm. uh, and I think we're all pretty determined, really determined people. And it's very rare as well that you get a group of people who are reasonably talented in their own way and have opinions and drive and all that, and they don't, and that they get on. And mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> how many years now? Nine years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nine years in counting, and uh, we all still get on. So that's. Yeah. Pretty amazing, really. And it's a good complementary skill set throughout the throughout the team. Um, Paul, why don't you tell us about skill sets? Skill sets. Uh, what does that man do? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, what does he do? Um, yeah, as he said before handing over, uh, very complementary skill sets, um, which is very lucky. Um, in all works of life, you tend to find that you come up against up against people that have. Um, large egos or significant opinions and even if they have the ability to back it up they don't always um, let other people shine we're really lucky that we've got an amazing group of people not just us as we've grown the company you know we've taken on more and more people of a like mindset where very very talented people of a whole mix of abilities but who are able to listen not think they can do it all to always look for the best practice in each department so Ian's got amazing ears if you don't mind me saying, um, as well as um, an electronics background, so he can design, but he's got an amazing sense of sound and what is a good sound. Bruce is second to none in the world in, in terms of technical ability. Richard, who can't be with us tonight, very practical. How does a product go together? Um, myself, glitter and crayons on the outside. How does it look? And all of those things coming together all the way through the design process. So it's very much a holistic approach. We're extremely obsessive compulsive people, um, extremely anal in terms of attention to detail. So when you look at our products, hopefully what you'll find is not only do they sound killer, um, but every detail of, of them has been considered, whether it's just the ratio of how they look, little details like a star and a handle, at the knob, the panel, every single aspect of it is been poured over and worried over by ourselves at great length. So hopefully you appreciate the blood, sweat and tears that goes into it. Okay, cool. So, from the pub, where did it start from there? Premises. Where did it go next? Um, should we tell them about the garden shed? Oh, yes, let's. Yeah, so um, <laughs> we decided we were all going we to do something. And um, then the planning began, began so we spent um, a period of time sort of business planning because we, we were pretty sure we wanted to do this in on a quite significant scale. But then we also had to start the technical development of the products mm -hmm. and we had nowhere to go in terms of um a premises or anything and at the time we weren't being we weren't being paid. We had no um financial support apart from our own funds and our families and stuff. So uh having looked around at various low cost options uh none of which we could afford we <laughs> we were we were lucky enough that my uh, gan shed at the bottom of the garden um was big enough to um to have a couple of benches put in there and that's where we started um it was literally a garden shed at the bottom of the garden which was very very <laughs> cold in winter and very very warm in in summer and me and Bruce spent every day for between two and a half to three years um, in there designing stuff and listening to stuff. And Richard would come over and um, and chop up bits of wood and and um, 
punch out metal and stuff and put the products together. And at sometimes, actually, we had up to four people working in this little tiny garage. But I tell you what, it gave us loads of good discipline in terms yeah, of, absolutely. in terms of we had a very very neat garden shed on the inside because we were developing <laughs> big old valve amplifiers. Um, you know, from scratch, and mm-hmm. we had to keep everything very, very neat and tidy. We had our own rudimentary parts ordering system, and uh, as you can imagine, even from the early days, we tried to be as as professional yeah. as we could. I mean, I don't know, Bruce, if you want to say anything about, even though we were in a shed, it was there was plenty enough in there for us to do the designing because it's more about what you know rather than the equipment you have and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, we knew what we needed to develop in terms of te- various technologies um, that have found their way onto Black Star products. And we kind of defined the features, but then we had to do the research and the development to make these features um, work, be versatile, be reliable, and be flexible enough to encompass a wide range of players. Because we did, from the start, we didn't want to pigeonhole ourselves in a particular amplifier type category so there was a lot of groundwork to do um as ian mentioned uh, we were working in a in a shed at the bottom of ian's garden to begin with and that kind of gave us a discipline as well because um we were in a small space we had a lot of work to do we had a lot of products around us in development and it kind of taught us to be very um, disciplined in terms of how we developed those products and the, the actual physical processes involved and I think that's one of the things that has carried through as the company has grown to its present state now is that kind of mentality has been passed down and understood um, by people who've joined us and it does aid and help us greatly in um, kind of being efficient and um, neat with our development. Uh, and I think that's something that's carried, that's not necessarily just the technical side of it, although I'm speaking from the technical side. I think that applies company-wide. You know, we are a very uh, sorted, organised company. Mm-hmm. So um, the innovations like ISF and DPR, mm-hmm. they were all designed and conceptualised in the garden shed? They were, yeah. Um, <coughs> you know, we 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 knew from the start that we wanted to kind of not be radically different purely to be radically different state at uh, stake. But we also knew that um, there were certain limitations with um, guitar amplifier technology as it stood. Mm. And you can either, you know, there's, there were people who decided to go a, a completely radically different way because they want to be different. Yeah. Um, we'd kind of learned, I think even before we started Blackstar, just in our previous uh, lives, that... Yes, you can be different, but if you're too radical and off the wall, um, you're going to move outside of people's comfort zones. Mm-hmm. Um, so the the key to the development we did in the shed days was to kind of take basic technologies that stood at the time, but enhance it without losing what made that technology attractive in the first place. Um, so it's... You could say it was subtle in a way, but I think the the sum of those subtle parts when they're in our products, whether it goes from the HT1 to the Series 1 200, it's all built on this same kind of base of knowledge. And I think another important thing that's worth saying is that um, having done that, we don't rest on our laurels because I think engineers have always, and engineers and other people involved in the company, there's always a curiosity, you know, how could we make this better? Mm. How can we make it cheaper yeah. if, you know, it's a low-cost product? Um, how can we make it more versatile? So I think that's the, the ethos, one of the ethoses of Blackstar that um, will always remain with the company. Okay, interesting. So um, let's talk a little bit about the cosmetic because the, um, the look of a Blackstar amp is very defined. And the name as well, that's something you uh, get asked all the time. How did the, how'd the name and the look come about? <laughs> the name. <laughs> um, the name came about as a very... Anyone who's ever been in a band will know the hardest thing in the band is not writing great songs. Well, that's quite hard. But the hardest thing is to come up with a band name. And the same thing for us as a company, because right from the start, we knew that we wanted to be available around the world. So you've got to have a name that's available that's not already trademarked around the world. And in this day and age, when so many companies have been... So many names have been registered, it's bloody hard. So 
we spent a lot of late nights in Ian's dining room with a really big whiteboard and just brainstormed all different areas in terms of names, different types of planes, weather systems, minerals, compound words, adjectives. Oh, my God, I can't tell you how many words, thousands of words we could have written a thesaurus. And it was really important for us to have something that wasn't going to immediately put us into a niche. We didn't want to be just a metal brand, brand or just a rock brand or just an indie brand. You know, we wanted something that all different kinds of players could feel comfortable next to. So that was a really important part of it. And the other thing as well, which is kind of quite unique within our field, not completely unique, but we didn't want it to be one of our surnames. Um, again, very much, you probably tell from hearing us talk about it, we're from a band background. It's very much a team effort and complementary skills. It's not just one man's vision and perfect idea. So it's important that it wasn't following that particular model. So we went through and, again, part of our OCD compliance was to make sure that we... Um, we got a short list and then we went through a whole rigorous investigation in terms of market research. So we went round to various different guitarists we knew. We went round rehearsal studios, just checking out what people thought. You know, was this a cool name? Wasn't it a cool name? Then we checked them online, find that um, they were already registered in Mongolia or somewhere, and then go back to the drawing board again. So um, it was a long, painful process, and it was getting really towards the end of when we were actually going to launch the company when we finally decided on black star and at that point it kind of crystallized and um at that point you have to live with it and uh after that, I have no regrets i think it's i think i'm still happy with it you know nine years in um in terms of cosmetics do you want me to talk yes. about that as well um cosmetics on the amp like i said earlier for us it's um every aspect of the product's really important to us so it's not just it sounds great it's got cool new features diff differentiation innovations um it's important it looks cool as well you know it's it's all about using our product, performing on stage, and it's got to look right. So we spent a lot of time and effort on that, you know, making it look contemporary but not overly modern. You know, it, it had to have a kind of timelessness almost. So, you know, we've all been around instruments and musical gear for far more, far too many years, more than I tell you. And so we took kind of all of those influences and our own ideas in terms of design went into that. And as I said, considering every single detail from the knob to the power switch to the ratio, the covering, every little detail um, has been lovingly crafted, <laughs> painfully crafted. <laughs> it's, um, it's quite often one of the most challenging parts of the, of the process in some ways. So. Okay. Yeah. Great. Actually, it's interesting when we develop products, it's quite often the the bit that's most problematic is the way it looks. Yeah. <clears throat> so the circuits and the sound can come together <laughs> early on mm. and then we're still you know yeah. getting towards production and we're still trying to decide exactly the finer details of cosmetics but we are learning as we go along to mm -hmm. make sure we cosmetic uh, consider that stuff yeah. earlier yeah. yeah and it gets easier as you move on so the first time we built any product it was every single aspect was new and had to be designed so mm. what kind of power switch is it what kind of corner is it all of those things how do you group different sets of controls on a panel but then as you move on, the next product is like, well, we've already got some rules and it's kind of, yeah. I wouldn't say it's easier, but you know, there's a set of rules now that we can work with and, and refine as we move forward. And uh, tell us a bit about those early photo shoots for product catalogs. <laughs> <laughs> early photo shoots for catalogs, yes. Yeah, so way back when, we, we launched a company at um, the Music Meta Show in Frankfurt in 2007. And um, we were building up the products ready to go and we, it was only it can only have been a couple of weeks before and we were still putting prototype units together and as Ian said we had no money no hope and no premises so everything was done at <laughs> Ian's house so we bought a couple of flash guns and a camera and I'm a key photographer so I got that job so we had Ian and Bruce doing the electrical bit in the shed we had Richard putting boxes together on Ian's patio. And then as each unit got finished, they would then bring them into Ian's front room um, where I was set up as a photo makeshift photo studio to do the pictures for the catalogue, um, which was fine at the beginning because it was pedals and combos. But by the time we got to doing the full stack, Ian's room, if you don't mind me saying, isn't a huge room. So <laughs> in order to get the whole stack in, we had to push the unit right against one wall. And then I was perched 
on the window sill <laughs> in Ian's bay window <laughs> to try and get far enough back to get the whole product in. And I think um, if you pick up one of our very early catalogues from that first shoot and you look really closely in any of the reflective services, you probably see a, an image of me perched on a window sill in Ian's front room. Very red faced, I would have thought. Very red faced and under a lot of um, <laughs> pressure because, again, because we were doing, the four of us had to do everything ourselves. So we got all we got the catalog put together into the printers, and then they then told us that there was so much black, go figure, in the catalog that the drying time for the ink um, wouldn't mean that they could get them produced by when they needed to. So it then meant that um, we drove to Frankfurt for that first show in a minibus full of gear. It really was like bad news on tour, <laughs> and so we had to meet up with the printers at South Mims Services. For those of you in the UK you might know where that is, and wait for a man in a car park to come along and bring the catalogues for us that we could then take to the show. But it all worked out nice in the end. Oh, it turned out nice in the end, yes. Yes, no blood pressure involved. OK, and so from the pub to the garden shed <coughs> to our, a lovely place, which is our, our first premise, premises. Who wants to talk about that? <laughs> Richard needs to be yeah. to talk about Richard. The premises. Go on, you can do the premises. I'll do the premises. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, <laughs> you the, no, no, I'd love to. Um, <laughs> I'll be Richard. We're all interchangeable, as you can see. <laughs> Four bald men. Um, yeah, yeah. So, first six months or so, we're all working from home offices, but it's despite all the modern technology, webinars and teleconferencing and all the rest of it, actually the, the best way of working together is being in the same place. So it became clear at that point we needed some premises. And um, our first premises were in a place called BizSpace and it's um, an industrial unit and there's lots of little blocks and you can kind of rent a small little unit. So your we own had little cottage. Your own little <laughs> cottaging industry. <laughs> so, um, we had a unit there and we built up Richard and um, with some help from his brother, I think, built up a room within a room, which was our lab. Um, so that was all soundproofed and insulated. And then there were two rooms which we used as offices. Now, as these were industrial units, they were like bigger versions of the shed, really, in that they had no carpet, no proper ceilings, no heating, no cooling. So again, in the winter, you would have laughed to see us. We were sat there with gloves, scarves, hats and coats on all day to try and keep warm. We had to put blankets over the PCs so that they would actually work because it was so cold in there. We were still cold. We were still cold, yeah, don't get me wrong, it was still bloody freezing. But then the converse of that was when it got to the summer, by about three o'clock in the afternoon, even in England, it was just so hot that you just couldn't even think straight. It was really unbearable. And after about a year of that, we hadn't had enough of that kind of treatment. so. We moved down the corridor in the same complex into a slightly nicer, bigger room, which had actually had carpet and a pretend ceiling and some vague attempts at heating. So it was kind of a little bit better, but it still wasn't particularly pleasant. And we then spent the best part of, must be three or four years there. Mm -hmm. And most exciting, just recently, about two months ago, we moved into our new premises where we are now. And this is a I was going to say it's purpose built. It's not purpose built. It's purpose built to be a building, um, <laughs> an office building. So it's a proper office building with two floors and a lift and lots of exciting things. But the really cool thing for us is as we've grown, more and more people come on board, you know, finding ways for them to work efficiently and safely um, is really important. So we're, the only person um, who uses a lift is Richard, by the way. It is. <laughs> and the reason he uses it is from health and safety reasons, yes. because you shouldn't carry hot drinks up the stairs. <laughs> Absolutely. And he does have quite a few hot drinks. Yeah, he be day. known to. Yes. <laughs> I like to live life on the edge, so I tend to walk up the stairs with my hot beverage and endeavour to not scold myself. Although I think Bruce might beat him on cups of tea per day. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So it's really cool we're here now. Um, um, we've actually got 50 people. <clears throat> work at Black Star now. Um, so we've got purpose-built labs, loads of listening rooms, loads of um, space for R&D to do loads of cool stuff, all the new engineers that we have here, and also a proper office environment as well, so people can actually work sensibly and even take their coats and gloves off when they come to work, which is kind of nice. It is indeed. Um, so how many products do Black Star have now? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> over 50? It is 50 over 50. Plus. It's, it's 60 know. plus. It's 60 <laughs> plus, isn't it? Yeah, it, must it be is now. 60 plus because yeah. we put it in a presentation the other day. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. It must um, be true. And what's unique about all those products? Um, what's unique about all those products? Probably the most important thing is the way they sound. Mm -hmm. I think um, 
Black Star established its own <laughs> signature sound in a way, and I think that is reflected in in all the products. Although the big deal with the way all Black Star products sound is, it's not really about the way we think a product should sound. It's about allowing guitarists to get the sound that they want to mm-hmm. get. This whole sound in your head thing. So having a excellent quality of sound is very important but also have a huge amount of flexibility so even something as you know um an entry level product like the ht1 for instance has got this isf feature on it and it's a amazing product that you can use at home in your bedroom yeah. right up to something like an s200 which has got mm-hmm. four channels and six modes and midi and all that um again that has the isf feature and the big deal with the the sound thing from from when we started was we did a lot of research into why guitar amps sounded the way they did and a lot of old guitar amps we've we've said this before is uh yeah. they tend to have a bit of a sweet spot where they sound amazing and then a lot of the other sounds that get out you get out of some of these old amps are not really very usable mm-hmm. what we've tried to do is make sure that there's a lot more sweet spots on our amps in fact you know all the sounds you get out of a black star generally will be good yeah um so yeah i think that's the the obvious defining feature is that when you plug into a black star it's the way it sounds and obviously the way it feels is massively important because you know it's it's all the the amp is an extension of the instrument Mm -hmm. and for me and, and certainly the way that i play it's more important than the guitar in terms of the way you sound for sure you know Mm. you can have um you can have a really crap guitar and a great sounding amp and you'll sound great but you can have the best guitar in the world and plug into a crap amp and you won't sound very good yeah um and the other thing as well is about the feel is Mm -hmm. that some guitarists can play almost any amp and they can get around and be fluent and stuff then there's other guitarists who really need a good sound to perform and i'm i am certainly of the latter where if i've got a bad sound i i just can't play um so i think that's in a way has been an advantage for me in that when i've been designing the products with bruce in the early days the way they felt was just as important as the way they sounded to me because if they sound if they felt good then i'd really enjoy it you Mm -hmm. can tell you know when an amp's really working in terms of the way it sounds and feels if i'm playing you can tell because i'll actually play and you won't be able to get get me off the amp you know what i mean which is pretty much all our amps are like that you plug into them and you just want to play more and more and more which is what it's all about um whereas maybe some of our competitors amps or traditional style amps don't have that and you have to do a lot of messing about with them to Mm -hmm. get them get them sound the way that you want them to do and innovation of course absolutely it's, important. Yeah. it's always important for us to not just have me two products we yeah. didn't want to there's no kind of value really if there's a product already exists to just bring more of the same to the market so it's really important for us to always have something unique on our products and sometimes it's a, a major feature like isf or dpr or like the new patent apply for tvp that we've brought out but there's a lot of incremental innovation that you don't see on the front panel just lots of really cool stuff that really came out of that two and a half years in the shed in terms of Mm. research into what makes amp sound good from first principles so the reason it's really easy to get a great sound mic'd up from a black star the reason the emulated out is so good and all those other things you know that you don't see it's not a big ta-da there's a new button or a new knob to twiddle it's very much kind of just all those things that go together to make a really great sounding amp Mm -hmm. yeah and they're all award-winning they are yeah they've all um every every range has got uh Every series has got its own, its own awards. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Guitar player, guitar world, guitarist, total guitar. So to have those independent accolades as well is kind of kudos yeah, to, the, to the team on that. Yeah. Um, so talking of awards, uh, our latest range, the ID series, has won a load of awards. So um, what makes that unique to anything else at that end of the market? What's unique about the ID? Mm, Bruce. <laughs> 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 um... Well, as Ian alluded to a couple of minutes ago when he was talking about um, kind of <clears throat> analog amplifiers or valve amplifiers, uh, we spent a lot of time, um, and not just in our Black Star career, but in our previous careers, kind of learning about how different amps sound, as Ian says, how they feel. 
And it's kind of, you learn that, but then if you are also involved on the engineering side of things, you ought, you also want to know, well, this has a certain attribute that I like, it's got something else that I don't particularly like, whereas if I try a different brand, um, that's got things that I like, not necessarily the same things as I liked on the first amp, it's got downsides. And we kind of always were very careful in evaluating products that were on the market because uh, we wanted to know what made them sound good, if they sounded good, what were the drawbacks. And we wanted to learn the underlying engineering reasons why that was. Because the kind of principle we've always worked on is, if something's good, make it better. If something's not very good, eliminate it or certainly reduce it. So we kind of had a big knowledge base to um, ground our designs on from day one, basically. And we still kind of add to that knowledge base now because we're always interested to learn new things. But it's also as that knowledge base grows, it gives you more versatility. And if you want to design a certain type of product for a certain market, you kind of know what technology to use in it. Um, and we do keep constantly trying to improve that knowledge base. You know, we are all naturally inquisitive people. Um, and... If something sounds good, why? And just don't kind of bullshit about it. Find out why. Understand why. And then think to yourself, OK, well, that's the answer. But now let's make it better. And I think that's always the, the way we've worked. Mm. And I think and I hope that it's always the way that we will work. Yeah, I suppose um, one of the big things about ID is the, the way it delivers lies. Absolutely, and the, yeah. The, the whole volume thing, which is based very much in a sort of technical understanding not a just a, we'll make it louder yeah. it was very much <laughs> from a, understanding the reason why yeah. valve amps sound the way they do and yeah and just kind of um gaining that understanding and then think okay well how can we apply this um id is a, a a really good example of how mm. we've taken a knowledge base that we've acquired between us collectively over quite a few years and say right we want to develop, develop some state-of-the-art signal processing amplifiers and we know that we can overcome the problems conventionally associated with um, modelling amps, whether you call them digital amps, mm. modelling amps. Um, they do kind of have a bit of a reputation for perhaps not being able to deliver and there's all sorts of um, mistruths quoted and flying about uh, as to why that is the case. It's the same thing, it's this kind of combination of observation, having the ears and the playing skills to be able to audition amp correct, amplifiers correctly, and then it's also just having the kind of connect up with the technology side of things, to say, well, this isn't magic, it's not vibe, mm -hmm. although hopefully the end user will get the vibe from it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in terms of the actual engineering, it's it's not black art. It's mm. understand what it is that makes something attractive in the first place. And then hopefully always having gained that understanding, say, well, let's go to the next step mm -hmm. because I can now... You start to kind of join the dots up, if you like. Yeah. And um, we're always looking for incremental improvements mm -hmm. on everything that we do. It's a, well, That's not just on the engineering side. I think that's just a company ethos. Yeah, certainly. Mm. Some exciting new products down the line, then, by the sounds of it. Yeah, I mean, we'd, we'd hope that that's always the way, you know, it will always go. Mm. Yeah, cool. We've got loads of, actually got loads of stuff under development at the minute. It's uh, mm. it's amazing how much, uh, how many ideas we've got. I think um, sometimes it's just, sometimes we're uh, throwing them out there faster than, <laughs> you know, people, <laughs> faster than we can make them. But no, we're definitely, because we've got so many sort of um, opportunities now in terms of we've got the, all the, um, valve ranges we've got loads of research going on on the valve side loads of um, new cool ideas a lot of cool ideas that are related to the, the work you do with artists mm -hmm. there's always cool things going on there you know new ideas new ways of applying technology and then the whole digital thing is new for us so there's loads of opportunities there yeah so um, I think we're, we're in a really good position yeah, in terms absolutely. of a business to to keep driving forward and getting people the products they want and hopefully allowing them to do something different you know i think sometimes it's frustrating for us that um amp design seems to stay still in so many ways and i know it's a frustration of bruce's sometimes that you know why do 
why do people just recycle the same old stuff? Mm. And I, I hope that we never become a company like that, you yeah. know. And certainly we we would like to give people even more opportunity to create new sounds. Mm -hmm. it's, it's essential, you know, I mean, I suppose it is getting new artists coming through, getting new young kids playing and all that stuff. Yeah. And uh, giving them new sounds that, that inspire them. So not just always classic British crunch, yeah. you know, classic British crunch is great and it's where we come from, but giving people other sounds, alternatives to that, mm. and also giving people other ways to create music, yeah. other platforms, because obviously kids aren't only plugging into valve amplifiers nowadays, they're plugging sure. into the PCs, laptops, whatever. Mm. It's an obvious thing to say. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're competing for for the mind share of, of the up and coming kids who might play guitar. They've mm. got lots of other things they could do with their mm -hmm. time and their hands uh, <laughs> as teenagers. So, um, so it's just making sure that we're, you know, help, you know, we're part of the big push to get people interested in, in music because yeah. that's, that's yeah. the future. Mm -hmm. The future isn't fat, bald, 40. Uh oh. What, else? <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> but yeah, the future is uh, people probably a few years younger than us who, who are just getting into it, really. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, do you have a memorable Black Star story? Or moment. Oh God! One that can be told. <laughs> <laughs> or one, one that can't. One that can't. Well, that's later. Probably not repeatable. I suppose we were talking about it earlier. One of the first things that sprang to mind was the whole first catalogue and first Frankfurt, because it really was such a low budget band type of affair mm. and um, pulling that off and the four of us in a van full a transit van with the seats taken out full of gear and obviously valve amps being quite heavy every time we had to stop at some traffic lights or a roundabout or the brakes got put on having to turn around and hold on to 100 watt valve heads that were threatening to go <laughs> shooting out through the front of the window was quite enjoyable at the time yeah. um, but I suppose from a, a product point of view one of the most memorable things is perhaps like the way ISF came about and getting to the point when from an idea and a wouldn't that be cool, could it work, <coughs> to actually proving out the circuit and that it did work, putting it into a product. And those first tests explaining to people with a, with a pedal and saying, look, this is what ISF does and over here it's like a British tone stack, over here it's like an American one, but you can completely set any point in between. And seeing the reaction of people and as... Um, a distributor in Benelux coined the phrase the black star grin because we tend to find as people start playing with that and they just get this grin because they kind of understand the possibility and they're hearing the sound that they've always wanted to get that they perhaps they haven't been able to get before from other equipment so I think that for me as a, as a you know to, to know that actually we had this idea and this is really something new that we're bringing to guitarists and it's not as you said not new just for the sake of being new it's something that's actually really usable and the kind of the ultimate vindication is if you get gave um, a product of ours with ISF on to somebody that perhaps has always used a particular brand in the past and you explain the way it works mm. so simple anyone can understand how it works and just leave them to play with it and when you come back they've never got it nailed exactly on the same setting as the the kind of product they've always used it's always you know it might be radically different or slightly off but for us it kind of vindicated the point that actually the sound they were really after the sound in their head wasn't being delivered by the product that they were using. It was close, but it wasn't exactly what they want. And again, the whole point for us is to give you guys the sound that you want and to enable you to express yourselves rather than us just going, this is a good sound and that's what you're going to have. Mm -hmm. Any other other, other, <laughs> I mean, amaz amazing black star moments would, would include, for so example, <laughs> um, no, no, seeing, um, seeing Gus on stage with Ozzy, yeah. um, with his what's the the correct church distortion. distortion church of distortion rig uh which obviously is kind of that's a variant uh actually was using he's using s200s at the time yeah. because that's the the gus heads up there so that was a product that was literally designed in the garden shed <laughs> yeah. um and seeing that uh, i think it was at birmingham nec that we saw him was it yeah uh, O2 Arena. O2, O2 Arena, yeah. And, uh, you know, in front of, I don't know how many tens of thousands of people. Mm. And um, 
that's always a. I have to say, mm. even after all this time, it's a nervous moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where you think, oh, because valves occasionally do he fail. A, he had, <laughs> he had so, a few backups, though. Yeah. yeah, he had a few backups. Yes, that was amazing. I tell you what, one for Joel would be um, when we took down the valve effects pedals down to funeral for a friend mm -hmm. the valve pedals that was probably that was the first artist mm -hmm. gil norton producing um telling tales was it what was it called their um i can't remember which album it was yeah but, but anyway yeah. The, the gil norton produced one which was awesome album mm. and and gil immediately got the the isf thing and just going down there and seeing a pro band that we all liked and respected really dig the product was was a massive like sort of um Mm. sort of vindication as Paul term that Paul used for uh, for what we were trying to achieve yeah but I mean to tell you two funny stories we have them every day <laughs> I mean unfortunately we're such um, Mickey taking <laughs> sods that uh, most of them it would be inappropriate to recount <laughs> but uh, I'd have to say every day there's a uh, <laughs> some silliness that happens there's a lot of laughter around Blackstar Absolutely. there's a lot of um hard work but also a lot of laughter so mm -hmm. it's we are a team on the edge <laughs> <laughs> well, that's brilliant guys time has flown um i think we've answered most of the questions that have come in but we'll hang around for a little bit afterwards just to uh answer any that we didn't um but thank you guys for that that was really cool and thank you everybody for tuning in we'll have another webinar next month in july uh, and we'll send you newsletters and it'll be all over our website what um, topic that's going to cover but until then we will see you very soon thank you thank you thanks